Kia ora, good evening. At 8.40pm Saturday evening, emergency services staff attended a serious motor vehicle accident on Waimea Highway, six kilometres north of Gore. A 19-year-old male suffered serious injuries after being struck by a vehicle and was subsequently airlifted to Dunedin Hospital. State Highway 94 was closed for a short time while emergency services staff dealt with the crash scene. Police inquiries are continuing into the cause of the crash and a number of witnesses are assisting. Raising funds for breast cancer research and enjoying high tea at the same time was the happy outcome for over 130 at the Calvin Hotel yesterday. There was just over $4,000 raised at the event, an event that is, is an invaluable component of the Breast Cancer Pink Ribbon annual fundraising campaign here in Southland. The 136 guests were treated to a glass of bubbly and a gift bag on arrival before dining on traditional tea party snacks, including of course lamingtons. Guest speakers were Lana and Jeremy Winders. Funds were raised through the $20 ticket price and a series of auctions. All monies raised go towards fighting breast cancer. For a second year in a row, Southland Beef's beef producer Barry McDonald's company Belly Hooley Beef has taken first and second in the best of brand retail section at the Beef and New Zealand steak of origin competition. Beef and Lamb New Zealand Chief Executive Dr Scott Champion says the steak of origin competition celebrates the best tasting beef in the country produced by New Zealand's world leading farmers. As well as the first and second places mentioned above, Ballyhooley Beef also won the People's Choice Award. I went along to the farmers market yesterday to ask Mr McDonald about his award winning steaks. The category is based on uh, obviously branded beef and my brand is Balahuli Beef and so I come, come under the retail section of that and I was lucky enough to get placed first and second within that class and uh, quite an achievement following up from winning it um, last year as well. Yes, I was just about to say that, so what makes a good steak? I guess it all starts with the grass. Well it does Hunter, um, feeding a, um, a, a, a cattle beast obviously um, so it can fulfil its potential. But also, um, to a degree, there is um, um, breeding within, you know, making sure the breeding is right so that uh, a beast can reach its full potential. You've been breeding beef for a while. How long and how many different, I guess, strains of beef are there? <laughs> <laughs> Breeds. <laughs> and what, what made you settle on these beasts? Um, well, the Murray Grey breed, I've been breeding that since um, the early 70s and um, have really only concentrated in, on kind of the meat side of it in the last 10 years. But um, there are many strains of beef uh, hunter, but um, I've settled on the Murray Grey because of A, the fact that they are docile, they have a small calf at birth, and, um, but go on to produce this high quality beef. And you're constantly sampling the product, obviously. What for you is a good steak? And it's obviously shared by the judges. <laughs> well, I think um, when it comes to um, looking at a good steak, a lot, of, lot isn't actually the cooking of it, and I'm not an expert on that. Um, but I look for the taste and the juice and the, the, you know, the, the flavour. It's actually down to the flavour of a good steak. At the weekend, young professionals were hosted by the Southern Institute of Technology as part of the Life Hack workshop. The purpose of, of Life Hack is to unite passionate young business people, designers, marketers, web and mobile developers, technologists, illustrators and musicians to create digital solutions within a workshop environment. Activities over the weekend included brainstorming ideas, receiving mentor feedback, including launching and publishing the concepts. Life Hack Southland event manager Anna Gruentha says Life Hack is making its way around the country. She says the event brings creative young people together to work on youth well-being. For 67 years, Val May Robertson has been teaching dance in the region. Yesterday was the last, last dance performance she will coordinate before moving on to projects she has long been putting off. The 82-year-old will continue teaching until she officially retires in September. I asked the Robertson School of Dance tutor whether yesterday's last concert was an emotional one. No, not really, because I was so concerned that it was a performance um, 
that it was the same as usual. So it hasn't really hit me yet that that's the last one. And we're talking, I mean, 60 years, we were talking off camera about 60 years since 1963, but you were in fact teaching earlier than that. Yes, I started teaching when I was 15 in Invercargill. And I was teaching in Invercargill until 1960. And then with three children, I decided that I couldn't just cope travelling in and out from Makariwa where we lived. And I, my husband built me a studio on the farm and I took some children there until we shifted to Black Mount in 1963. Have you always had about the same number of students and how have those students changed over the years or is a young person a young person? Um, no, the young people today are different to they were then. I don't think they're as self-reliant and uh, as mature as they used to be. How important is that teaching that you've done over those years? We're talking intergenerational now. I think we were saying sort of three generations at least. How important is that they partake in, in dance? I think that it gives the children a discipline and learning to be instructed by other people. I'm talking about the, the little ones. So that by the time they go to school, they are used to being told to do things by other people, not just mum and dad. Have there been particular students that you've watched go on to other things uh, over the years? Oh, oh definitely. But um, as far as ballet is concerned, particularly in the teaching field, um, I've trained probably ten teachers over the years. Right, and you yourself, before you were teaching, you obviously started teaching when you were very young, but before then were you a dancer yourself? Uh, no, but at when I was 21, I did go to Australia and danced with the Australian uh, National Theatre Ballet Company for a short while, but I had my school in charge of one of my senior students and then I felt it was time to come back and take over again. Well, you've got a well-deserved break in front of you and are you keen to see the school continue on? Will there be someone to continue on? I'm hoping that there will be somebody that um, will come to a tout out and because it's a great area and there's great support and pupils travel for a long way to a tout out and some would not be able to travel to Invercargill. And you yourself, this will leave a, quite a void in your life. Have you got something to fill it with? <laughs> Um, it will create a void, but um, there are things that I have wanted to do and haven't had time to do, so I will find, now, find the time to, to do those things. And we wish Val May all the best in her retirement. Around 1600 got the chance to enjoy much of the musical talent the city has to offer at the Many Voices One Heart concert at Stadium Southland last night. 160 singers, a dozen musicians and 25 pipers and drummers performed together for the first time at the special free concert. Organiser Angela Newell says the concert proved to be a great opportunity for the public to see the city's established acts perform side by side with up and coming talent. The music was adapted and arranged arranged by Matthew Salapu. Ms Newell says organisers are exploring the possibility of bringing all the city's musicians together for a similar performance next year. And stay right where you are after the break. We have an extended interview with National's Clutha Southland candidate, Todd Barclay. Welcome back to South Today News. With Bill English opting for a place on the National Party list, the seat of Clutha Southland, in which he holds a 16,000 vote majority, came up for grabs. The nomination was won by 24-year-old Todd Barclay, who has experience working within Parliament as well for international tobacco giant Philip Morris. We interrupted his campaigning in Winton today to ask him firstly about his age and his time in the tobacco industry. Well, I think it's an advantage, you know, there are a number of examples of um, politicians who came into Parliament early. Nick Smith was 23, Simon Upton was 23, Bill English was mid to late 20s, um, you know, Nicky Kay was about 27. There are a number of examples of um, great politicians who came in young. Have, have you struck opposition? I know Winston Peters sort of hit out at you at the Great Power meeting last week. Uh, have you struck opposition as you're getting around the region? 
Yeah, I think Parliament's a representative place at the end of the day, um, and Mr Peters is entitled to his own opinion, but you know, well, he's representing an ageing demographic, I'd like to do the same thing. There are hundreds of thousands of voters around my age, so I think you know, I've got an advantage of being able to appeal to some of those younger people. Let's talk about that other issue. I guess it was the Philip Morris connection. Were you conscious when you applied for that job that it could create issues? You obviously had political ambitions prior to that. Yeah, um, the reason why I took that role was, you know, first, like, firstly, I don't smoke. Um, I don't encourage smoking, and my role wasn't in the sale of tobacco. But the thing is, at the end of the day, it was a job for me. I was there for eight months, a short part of my, my experience, uh, and it was in order to gain experience to bring it back to politics. It's the most highly regulated environment in New Zealand, and in order to for me to gain an understanding of that um, back on the side of government, um, I think you know, having worked in it gives me a, a good appreciation of that. You'd fully endorse the government's ambition to be smoke-free by 2025? Absolutely. You know, the government's um, priority being smoke-free by 2025 is um, an incredible ambition. New Zealand and Australia are the two um, world leading in terms of tobacco control regulation. Let's talk about the electorate itself. It's an enormous electorate with a lot of diverse occupations. There's Queenstown, which of course is a massive tourist destination, always full of development. And then there's more isolated region areas around the electorate. Are you uh, conscious of that and what's your plan to get around them all? Yeah, absolutely. You know, Clint Southland's the largest general electorate, uh, as you pointed out before, um, beside the Mary electorates. And um, at 38,000 square kilometres, it's the size of Switzerland. So, and there are um, a large number of diverse communities and with their own local issues. So, uh, you know, we're, we're heavily reliant on, you know, the primary industries, uh, sectors in this, in this electorate, um, in terms of trade, but also tourism as well. Um, where uh, you know, Queenstown is, is leading in developing New Zealand's brand and their proposition to the rest of the world. I was thinking also on the way here to Winton to interview you today that you were actually born outside. We're looking at 30 years since that Longy government and the, uh, the rapid deregulation really of the New Zealand economy. Are you conscious of that, that, that you, you didn't live through that but you would have read about it surely? Yeah, you know, I think um, as times change, politics of the day changes as well and you know, we've got our own challenges right here now. We've got, uh, we're just we're coming out the back end of a global financial crisis and also the Canterbury earthquake recovery. Uh, it's been significant to our times as well. It's important um, recognising the milestones that the country has overcome in order to uh, make uh, the right decisions going forward. What has your experience been in Parliament? You've worked with Bill English uh, and also the Prime Minister's office. Yeah, so I started in Bill English's office as an intern, mainly working on electorate issues for a year and a half, so I had a lot of work down uh, in this area with across those three offices down here. And then I worked for the Prime Minister for um, just briefly in his correspondence team um, and then Jerry Brownlee's office for about three or four months just over Pike River and Canterbury Earthquakes, uh, again sort of providing administrative support to his team and then for Hekia Parata uh, when she um, became the Minister of Energy and Resources and subsequently followed on to be her advisor when she was Minister of Education. I know it's too early to preempt this, but there's an enormous majority down here. Are you bracing yourself for that parliamentary <coughs> world? You'll obviously be aware of how brutal it can be. Yeah, you know, I don't think, um, you mentioned the majority, um, Bill English has done a fantastic job over the last 24 years building the electorate to what it is, and um, I, for one, don't want to be taking anything for granted. I need to, the biggest challenge I've got is getting out in front of as many people as possible, building the trust and the respect of the people of Clutha Southland, because that's what, um, that's what Bill English has done and that's what the next Member of Parliament needs to do in order to deserve that role. Yes, there is a good Labour candidate in Liz Craig and of course the Greens are putting up a good candidate as well so there will be some competition, if not, there will be for the list vote. Yeah, absolutely, you know, um, I think... You know, You'll be keeping an eye on the list vote. <laughs> keeping an eye on the list vote, but again, the same thing uh, is, needs to be said for them, like, uh, they need to get out there and put their proposition to as many people as possible and that's what I intend to do. You're a full-time candidate now? Yes, I am, absolutely. You know, uh, and the other thing you sort of mentioned about the National Party's proposition as opposed to the Labour and the Greens is that um, we're heavily reliant on the primary sector down here. Um, the ETS, um, you know, what the Greens are wanting to do to fast track that would absolutely cripple this area. So I think just voters need to be mindful of the full, full suite of propositions that the respective parties are putting to the electorate, not just the, not just the ones that may appeal at the face value. I guess the biggest battle for you is name recognition, isn't it, and getting yourself out there as the candidate. What will you be doing over the next few months? And of course we'll be watching you with great interest and touching base <laughs> with you, but what are you going to be doing? 
Yeah, that's right. Name recognition is going to be the biggest thing. To say, you know, Bill's built the seat to what it is over the last 24 years. He's done a fantastic job for the electorate and uh, getting in front of as many people as possible uh, will be the challenge. Um, you know, I'll be employ deploying sort of some social media tactics and other tactics, but nothing beats, you know, going around door to door, meeting some people face to face. So I'll be doing that as much as I possibly can. That's all from the news team coming up in sport. Highlanders Chief Executive Roger Clark from the newsroom. Have a very good night.